Welcome to another episode of Leadership and Character Development Show for the Greco Roman national team. And uh, we've got a world, two time world champion, Olympic champion with us, and uh, former uh, Division I coach. Uh, Mark's been quite a leader in. In, in this field of wrestling. And uh, we're just happy to get a chance to visit with you, Mark. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Matt. I really uh, have a lot of respect for you. You And uh, I've always, uh, I really I really like that story Chael Sonnen told about uh, when you were at my wrestling camp at Rick's College. That was a pretty funny story. Well, the first time I ever met Mark was, uh, Rick was right after I started wrestling. I, I literally started about two weeks before this, and I, I heard that there was a, uh, a, a seminar with an Olympic champion, and I should probably go down and, and uh, learn from him and listen to, to his stuff. And the only thing I took away from that was uh, what a violent man Mark Schultz was and how he was willing to rip a guy's shoulder off to win the Olympic medal. And uh, I, I've kind of tried to emulate that in my entire uh wrestling career was uh violence does serve a, a purpose in this sport and uh it's it's a rough sport and if you're not willing to you know get your arm broken or whatever it is uh maybe you got to find a new sport i think you've uh you've emulated that concept quite well in your career matt was that was that the lesson you were trying to share mark <laughs> did i get it right <laughs> The lesson I was trying to share was wrestling is the greatest martial art. And if you wrestle, then you don't have to take any crap from anybody. Well, you know what? I, I think that's, that's honestly why I joined the sport really, because I was 98 pounds as a freshman in high school. And, uh, you know, I, I went from a very rural town that didn't even have a high school to a, to a smaller city, uh, you know, just outside of Portland, Oregon there, uh, Gladstone, that uh, had had a wrestling program. And, you know, and, I, and, you know, being, growing up, I mean, bullying was part of the deal. I just, I just thought that was part of it. Now we have these anti-bullying campaigns and we shouldn't bully kids, but I think bullying, being bullied is what, you know, helped me out in life, it, honestly. And it, it's kind of a, uh, a message that's counterculture. It, it's not uh, politically correct, but what I learned uh, from wrestling helped give me the confidence that I could defend myself in a, in a situation. And I think you're absolutely right. I still agree to that statement that wrestling is the most effective martial art. It is, you know, because uh, people don't understand, you know, I, I have a lot of respect and love for jujitsu. I have a black belt under Pedro Sauer. But one thing people don't take into account, I don't think, is uh, most fights happen on the street and streets are very hard surfaces. And if you're on top, all you have to, and your opponent's head is, you know, two inches from the pavement, all you gotta do is smack his head on the pavement a couple times and the fight's over. And you know, somebody jumps into the guard against me on the on concrete. First thing I'm going to do is smash their head in the ground. And I don't think people take that into account because they're always competing on so soft surfaces. And you have to do that in jujitsu to learn all those brutal moves that jujitsu teaches you. I I uh, so I think the combination of wrestling and jujitsu together is better than each of them separately. Yeah, they're, they, they are different different sports and different tactics and strategies. The goals are a little different. We're not trying to hold a guy on the mat and uh, put his shoulders. We're trying to get him to submit, which is which is different than wrestling that uh, that that we do, and that most of the people when they understand wrestling out there and the people that watch our show here, you know, they they don't look at wrestling as a martial art. They look at it as just a sport. How how do you how did you approach the sport? You came in from gymnastics. You had a different background as well, and you got in late as well. I did. I started when I was a junior in high school, and I was a gymnast prior to that. And I didn't know anything about martial arts. I don't think anybody really knew anything about martial arts at that time because, you know, you've got Black Belt Magazine, you've got Karate Magazine, and everybody is trying, was, was trying to look for that 
one best martial art so that they could choose that and practice that discipline. And, and, and I just kept looking and looking and trying to find what martial art was the most effective and I couldn't figure it out. And all I really knew was what I saw on TV and the movies and all I really, and, and, and at the time, you know, when I was, was 1975, 76, I, all I knew was that Bruce Lee was the most famous martial artist in the world. And he was kicking the crap out of 20 guys at a time in Fist of Fury and Enter the Dragon. And I thought, man, if I can, if he can beat the crap out of 20 guys at once, I can surely be, beat one guy, my, my brother Dave, who you talk about being a bully. I was bullied my whole life by my brother Dave. And uh, thank God. I mean, but he would always defend me if I ever got bullied by anybody else. He was right there to defend me. But so I made the decision. I made the, I, I came up with the idea that if I could just, and I wasn't happy with who I was, even though I was a gymnast, I could do incredible acrobatic tricks, but I wasn't happy with who I was. I had a terrible uh, lack of confidence. I couldn't talk to girls. That was a big thing. And I thought, you know, if I could just learn what Bruce Lee knows, then I could show my brother who the real dominant one in the family was. And so one day, me and Dave got into this fight. He knew how to get under my skin. And he got under my skin one day. I think it was on my 15th or 16th birthday or something. And he, he, I, I thought, okay, now I'm going to show him who the real boss in the family is. And so we get out on the front lawn. And I took a swing. And he shot in. And he got the mount and just turned my face into a bloody pulp. And I was so humiliated. But it taught me that wrestling, it was uh, the grappling match for the striking arts, you know, the fights end up on the ground. And so I quit Kang Sudo, which was Ch Chuck Norris's style. I went off the wrestling team the very next day. And I just, you know, this is it for me. I'm gonna, it's wrestling is gonna be do or die. And thank God Dave was smart enough to know how effective a martial art wrestling was. And thank God I, I got into it because it really did make me happy to, when I learned how to defend myself through wrestling. That's, so, that's, per, that's pretty cool. Go ahead, Rick. I was just going to say, it's funny you should mention that with the street fight element and, and all that. Um, one of the ways I, I paid through school was we were, uh, I worked in a nightclub on the Jersey Shore, um, big multi-million dollar club, and we, we did security. I uh, started off as a bouncer and we basically ended up hiring my whole college wrestling team to come down or high school guys, you know, but we didn't look very scary, but we had a few guys on the staff who were either linebackers in football or martial artists from like karate or something. And they weren't very effective when, when things went down at night and it spilled out into the streets or the alleys or something like that. And like you said, every, it's going to go to the ground and you either have to know, what to do and be comfortable there against people way outside your weight class or whatever. And, you know, the, you know, the parameters of like a kata in karate or, or some other, it doesn't do much for you at that point. No, I, I did not get into wrestling to win tournaments. I got into it to, to learn how to beat people up because I was not happy with myself. And I knew that I didn't have confidence and wrestling is the greatest. I, I believe wrestling, the greatest character builder. It's the greatest confidence giver that any kid can go out for. I also would like to say to all the parents out there that are listening that if I had to do it over again, I would get my kids into at least two years of gymnastics prior to specializing in any other sport because Gymnastic teaches you to visualize complicated, risky techniques. And when I say risky, I mean gymnasts have the highest per capita rate of broken necks of any NCAA sport. So, and back when I was competing, we didn't have the spotting equipment and the crash pads that they have today. It was like, you know, you got a couple spotters and it was just like, hey, go for it, you know, like a flyaway on the high bar, you know, and, and, you just didn't have the safety equipment that you have today. And now if you look at gymnasts, they're incredibly uh, 
advanced now because of the advancement of the of the safety equipment they have. You got a crash pit where you can dive straight in head first and not be hurt. We didn't have any of that when we were when we were learning at Stanford and this other club I went to. So, but gymnastics gives you. I mean, it's not you don't you have to be a brain surgeon to know that gymnasts are the greatest athletes in the world. And when I say greatest athletes, I mean can do the most variety of movements of any athlete in the world. I mean, just look at them. They're just incredible. And they, they, when you have that kind of ability, you have superior strength, flexibility, uh, explosive power, um, kinesthetic sense, which is, I have a master's in exercise science, kinesthetic sense is the uh, ability to know where your body exists in space at all times. And you just come out of gymnastics with this, I mean, gymnasts never get dizzy. When I was in wrestling and I went, let's say I got into a flurry and we went out of bounds. I never got dizzy when I walked back to the center, no matter how, uh, you know, discombobulating that flurry was. Uh, you know, gymnasts are just used to knowing where their bodies are, spinning and twisting in all uh, different positions. And so I would, encourage all parents to get their kids into gymnastics for about two years before they decide to go into any other sport. Because if you can visualize complicated risky techniques like they do in gymnastics, this is just not a physical thing. It's a mental thing too. You can visualize how to do anything in any sport. My coach, after he quit being a gymnastics coach, he taught himself how to be this incredible golfer. And it just, he figured it out himself. And that's what gymnastics will allow you to do. So, Mark, Mark it makes me have a question uh, right off the bat for you, because one of the things that Matt had always told me about you that uh, he thought made you very special as a competitor is he said that you had one of the most unique mindsets to competing um, that he had seen. And he said that you were just an animal and, and, but that it was very different than what a lot of other guys might have uh, espoused when they were out there on the mat and training. And so when you talk about that visualization that was happening either before the match or in the middle of it, um, kinesthetic awareness, um, well, how would you describe your mentality, your psychological approach to wrestling, both basically in three ways, one as a sport towards wrestling, two during training, but three uh, during the match competition, like, what was your mindset when you went out there? Well, I had uh, two things that helped me. Well, I don't know, one helped me and one didn't. One, I was the brother of the greatest high school wrestler in history, Dave Schultz. And living in the same house with this guy, it's like a constant inferiority complex. You know? <laughs> this guy can just beat the crap out of anybody. I mean, in the world, in high school, he pinned Ch uh, Chuck Yagla in the Great Plains. And Chuck Yagla was a two-time NCAA champion in the OW in the NCAAs. Not only did he beat Chuck in the Great Plains, he beat the World Cup champion Joe Tice in the same tournament. And then that qualified him to Tbilisi. And the national governing body president at the time, Newt Koppel, he was the head of the AAU. And he was like, we're not bringing Dave to Tbilisi. He he really couldn't have beaten Chuck, you know, nine out of 10 times. That was a fluke and they weren't going to bring him. But the guys on the team said, you got to bring him. He qualified. So they reluctantly brought him and he took a silver medal, which was higher than any other American on the entire U.S. team. And then he came back to the United States and he didn't qualify for the state championships because he was over at Tbilisi wrestling. And the coach, my coach Ed Hart, who I'm, now applying to get into the California Wrestling Hall of Fame. He petitioned the California Coach, Coach State Coach Association to get Dave into the California State uh, Tournament qualifiers, which he did at uh, about 100, at 170 pounds. Dave only weighed about 160 pounds, but he wrestled all year at 170 because they had a pretty good 160 pounder and Dave could beat anybody in any weight. So, Dave won the California State. He pinned his way to the finals, beat the guy in the finals 12-1. to 1. Then he went to the National Open Greco Championships, and he won that. And he got the most falls in the least amount of time, the Guerrero Award. And this is all while he was in high school. And I'm living in the same house with this guy. So the pressure to succeed was 
just incredible on me. But I also knew that if I could do fairly well against him, I could do fairly well against anybody because he's the best in the world. So I had a huge advantage being Dave Schultz's brother. And the other thing was, um, I, uh, well, first of all, I didn't look at wrestling as a sport so much as I did a martial art. And plus I had a gymnastics background. And plus I had a very low max VO2. You know, max VO2, I have a master's in exercise science. I said that uh, maximum VO2 is the maximum volume of oxygen your body can consume. It's measured in milliliters of oxygen per kilogram body weight per minute exercise. And I had only like 50 milliliters per kilogram per minute, and which is eight points lower than the second lowest world or Olympic wrestling champion ever uh, measured, which is a tremendously, it's kind of like the Oakland days. Remember Billy Bean is on, in, the, in Moneyball, he goes, there's the worst team in the league, then there's 50 feet of crap, and then there's us on the bottom below that. That's kind of like where I was. And so I was a very, very anaerobic guy. I could not run long distance. I didn't have endurance, but I had incredible explosive power when it came to anaerobic explosions, sprinting. I was a sprinter and I was the fastest guy on my, my, my team, except maybe Israel Shepard. Me and him were pretty close together. But like if we ran stadium stairs, you know, I was always the first to the top. And so I, but wrestlers, the, referees did not like that style of wrestling where you, you block your opponent off and you defend yourself and then all of a sudden explode. They like the Dan Gable style where you just shoot, 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 fatigue your opponent into exhaustion and then the guy falls down from fatigue. And, you know, I had to, I had to, I mean, there's a lot of stories I could tell about, you know, how I tried to overcome that, but I focused my mind and I focused my, uh, my 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 uh, all my energy into um, trying to figure out how to win and well it's not an aerobic sport it's sort of half aerobic half anaerobic how to win this type of sport using a very anaerobic body and it was something and at first I tried to eliminate my my weakness which was my aerobic capacity by running like crazy I probably added up all the miles I ran I probably ran around the world at least one time and I just but a person after getting my master's I, I couldn't I could I realized I could not improve my anaerobic power or my aerobic power more than about eight points so I walked around normally at about 42 milliliters per kilogram per minute and I could train myself up to about 50, but that's as far as you can go because it's your DNA that determines whether you're gonna be aerobic or anaerobic. And there was just no place I could go above 50. I mean, you're born that way. You're either a long, you're born a long distance runner or you're born a sprinter. There's nothing you can do about it. So, so you were so you were going out there to crush people early because you didn't wanna you didn't wanna do an eight minute match with well, uh this is, this is what happened. This is how my style developed. My brother, okay, my brother's the number one recruit in the nation. Oklahoma State offered me a scholarship to get him. They didn't even care about me. They just, they like, that's how bad they wanted him. And so he comes back from Oklahoma State. I miraculously won the state my senior year. I didn't win. I only competed in two tournaments my entire life before the state qualifiers my senior year. The Alice Al tournament, which I lost my first match and was eliminated. The Monta Vista tournament, which I took third in. Those are the only two tournaments I had ever competed in. These are 16 team tournaments. And then, but I knew I was pretty good because at the end of the year, I was always competing with these Stanford guys. I, I, uh, I would memorize like Steve Martin routines or Bill Cosby routines. And I'd go over to Stanford and I'd make the coach laugh and he liked me. So he let me hang around him. And so he let me work out with the Stanford guys. Well, that's a huge advantage for a high school kid to work out with a college guys. The biggest jump in quality you're ever going to make is from high school to college. So here I was working out these high school guys I and mean, college guys and I'm, and I'm doing pretty good against them. So even though I wasn't winning in competition, I knew I was good enough to win. And so I won the league, the region, the state, and uh, the, the section and the state at the end of my senior year. It was a miracle. And I started believing in God after that. It was so miraculous. And I just, 
and, and so then I got the scholarship to college. Well, I chose, you know, there's this old saying by, uh, I don't know who said it, what does not kill you makes you stronger. It's not really true. You take the little kid and put him up against Mike Tyson and have him beat the crap out of him. The kid's not going to get stronger. You got to take things step by step. You got to go gradually. So I chose UCLA because I thought if I chose Oklahoma State, they were going to kick the crap out of me and ruin my confidence and I'd never be any good. So I chose UCLA. Dave was at Oklahoma State at the time. And then he transferred to be with me at Oklahoma State. Well, between the summer of my senior year when I won the state and the, the, the beginning of my freshman year, Dave came back from college and he would go, hey, and now he's freshman of the year. He just took third in the NCAAs. I won the state. We're of the exact same weight. And he'd go, hey, you want to go work out? And I'd be like, nah, I don't feel like it. And he'd say in this real high-pitched, feminine-sounding voice, you pussy. And I'd be like, okay, that's it. You are going to die today. So we'd go work out. And he would just kill me, like 50 to nothing. And this happened every single day, same way. You want to work out? No, pussy, let's go. You're going to die. And he'd kill me. And I finally, after three months of getting killed, I thought, you know what? I'm, I, I'm, I can't score. I'm, I'm being killed every day, 50 to nothing. If I can't score any points, Maybe I can just keep him from scoring points. So I started breaking his locks, backing up. I just became this incredible staller. And, and, and I got so good at stalling, I, I could not only back up and stall, I could hold my ground and so I could even move forward and still stall. And so I got to where I had an almost impenetrable defense. And I knew if I could keep Dave from penetrating my defense, I could keep anyone. And so that kind of how my style developed. I was very defensive until I saw an opening and then I would explode with as much an uh, an anaerobic power as I could. That's how my style developed. That's a long story to answer a question, isn't it? That was a great, that was a great way to answer that story, Mark, to tell you the truth. So you guys ended up at, at uh, UCLA and then, and then a year later, what, they dropped that program? Yeah, it was a year after Dave and I left. A lot of people think we left because they dropped the program. It's not true. We left. We both made the junior. The UCLA program was in such disarray. The coaches were always fighting with each other. And we thought, you know, if we stay at UCLA and win an NCAA title, it's going to be a miracle. Let's go somewhere where instead of it's a miracle, it's expected. So we met the, we both made the junior world team and we met Jim Humphrey, the coach of university, he was the assistant coach at the University of Oklahoma. And we really got along with him great. He was always laughing and cracking jokes and hanging out. I, we loved the guy. And we thought, let's go to Oklahoma. That's a big time college. They're going to have lots of crowds. We can feed up their energy. They'll expect us to be national champions. Whereas at UCLA, Nobody's going to expect anything out of us. They're going to have a lot of other priorities. But at Oklahoma, wrestling is the only priority. So we transferred to Oklahoma the, the very next year. And then the year after we transferred, UCLA dropped the program. They had a year of competition after we transferred before they dropped the program. Okay. All right. Well, that clears up that story because I, I was along the, those same lines that – you guys left because they were dropping the program. Now we're seeing a lot of college programs getting dropped. Just yesterday, the news about Fresno State broke. Did you happen to see that in the news, Mark? I did not. You're telling me Fresno State is dropping now after they reinstated it? Yes. This came out yes just yesterday. Oh God. <laughs> no, I'm not even. I'm not even surprised. I I, I was a professor at Cal State for four, the last four years. I just left the Cal State. System. and with corona and everything the system is so over leveraged and they're internally crashing down i mean there's a lot of problems and and I, it's a tragedy about but man i tell you what they're yeah the, um yeah there's a lot of mismanagement at the csu it's system. really a crime you know because wrestling anybody who's ever done it anybody that knows people that have done it knows that it's the greatest character building activity anybody can do and to eliminate wrestling programs is a crime it's a sin to me i mean it should be to everybody if people know how valuable wrestling is 
they would never drop it. They would always, matter of fact, the, co the guy that started the Fresno Valley or the California Central Valley powerhouse uh, was a guy, I forget his name, he was a high school superintendent for the Central Valley and he bought wrestling mats for all the grammar schools in the entire Central Valley and they became the the most powerful area in the in the state maybe the country you know California only has one division so if you're the state champion in California you are the real state champion and I you know I counted uh, when I went and gave the awards out one year to the California state championships I counted like how many guys won from the Central Valley and it was like 80 percent you know and I think it all went back to that uh, his name was Doc something, not Doc Holiday, but Doc something. Anyway, uh, he had he he saw the value, the real value of wrestling, and I think if administrators knew the real value of wrestling and what kind of people it produces, you know, they they would never drop it. But because of Title Nine, and I call it the misinterpretation of Title Nine, because Title Nine has three prongs. It has the interest that the, the genders have, it has the efforts the schools are making, then it has proportionality. And you can't really prove interest unless you look at intramurals or something. And you can't really, I don't know, prove the efforts the schools are making, but you can always prove proportionality just by looking at the numbers. Well, the truth <laughs> is football is never gonna get touched because that's the goose that lays the golden egg that funds the entire athletic department. So no one's ever going to cut any scholarships from football. And in order to equalize the number of scholarships between men and women, you got to cut every other male sport out there. And wrestling's always the first on the chopping block because there's no corresponding female sport. It's, it's, a, it's terrible the way they, they interpret that law. Well, you know, one of the things that you said, like if they knew what wrestlers were and, and what it built in people and, you know, kind of what both of you guys said, you know, sort of a history of being bullied. And, and I was too, I was, I was 98 pounds as a freshman too. I, and I, I used to get, I was a huge dork. I mean, I'm still a huge nerd, but like, you know, like, but it was worse when I was a kid. And I think that if people understood that the role that the sport has played in, you know, it's not, I don't, I don't actually, I think the stereotype of like the jock thing is all that accurate because of the majority of people aren't, Olympic champs. They're, they're kids who get bullied and went there to learn a martial art or how to defend themselves or build some confidence. Um, you know, there'd be a lot more appreciation for it. But I wanted to ask, you know, I, I, I was doing some homework last night uh, and I saw a talk that you gave on, on YouTube and you had started off with an introduction where you were asking people like, what would you do? What's it worth to you? Are you willing to die? Are you willing to bleed sweat or sweet sweat blood? And, give, and you talked about giving up uh, the impact on like social life and relationships. And I just wanted to kind of follow up and ask on that a little bit deeper. Like, what do you, what do young guys who want to be the best, you know, uh, in the world, the best in the world, not the best in the state, not the best in the country. What do guys who want to be the best in the world who are training? what do you want them to know about what it really takes that you think that maybe guys don't always know? Well, Matt knows this as well as I do. You've got to sacrifice everything else for your, your sport. Your, you, you just have to, there's, there's no room for much of anything else. You just, you know, it, you just have to have this, 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 this uh, tunnel vision where you're focusing, focusing, focusing on, you know, how can I get better? Uh, and, it, uh, you know, if people want to, they can go to that uh, speech and I explain kind of how it happened for me. And I can only tell my own story, but I think, um, you know, it, <laughs> I had a very, I had so much motivation to become good in wrestling. Number one, because I had this great brother who was basically like, it's like growing up in, with like a monster in your house. And I didn't know how to defend myself against this guy. 
and he was, I had no power over him. So it was a, I, when I was growing up, I thought it was a curse, but a lot of times people, they don't realize this. That sometimes their worst curses end up becoming their greatest blessings. And that's what, when I was a kid, I thought he was the worst curse. He turned into the greatest blessing I could have possibly had. And, you know, when, when he died, that really just killed me, you know, because we were kind of like twins. You know, a lot of people think me and Dave are very different. And we are as far as our personalities on and off the mat. Dave's personality, Dave had the ability to change his personality on and off the mat. I pretty much didn't have time for that. I was starting so late in my career that I just was focusing on winning. I didn't care what people thought of me. I just wanted, I mean, I do to a certain extent, but I, I just wanted to win. And so my personality was pretty much the same on and off the mat. But other than that, Dave and I were very, very similar as far as our uh, personalities and our, our styles you know, our wrestling styles, he was a little different because he was ambidextrous because he was born with dyslexia. And, you know, dyslexia means that one of your brain, one side of your brain doesn't take dominance. If you're right-handed, your left brain dominant. If you're left-handed, your right brain dominant. His brain never took dominance. So he was always a kind of uncoordinated and he kind of pudgy and fat as a kid. His nickname was Pudge and kids made fun of him. And then he broke some kid's head open on the concrete that made fun of him and put the guy in the hospital and he became known as the toughest kid in school and kids quit messing with me because they were scared of me because they were scared of Dave. They weren't really scared of me, but, uh, yeah, that, uh, uh, I, you know, if you want something, it's all about how bad do you want it? If you want something bad enough, you're willing to sacrifice anything and everything to become that thing. And you must respect the people that have accomplished great things in that thing, or you're disrespecting the very thing that you want to be. Does that answer your question? I, I could go on and on, but does that no, answer? No, that, that does answer, but it, it makes me think of something else because like you, I, I mean, I was willing to sacrifice, like you said, I, I mean, I, I had I had a wife and I had kids while I was doing this, but I was still making all those sacrifices. But is there is there a cost uh, for for being so single minded? What is that cost? And has, has that has there been a cost in your life? I mean, you were the Olympic champ, you were two time world champ, you were the best in the world, multiple occasions, you know, and proving yourself, and you did that by being single minded and and sacrificing which also means being pretty selfish. Is, has there been a cost? Right. That does. You have to be selfish, which is kind of a terrible thing to say. You know, maybe that's not the right word or whatever, but you have to sacrifice everything for the cause, right? I mean, in wrestling, just like in MMA, you're basically building your career on the destruction of everybody else's career. That's a pretty selfish thing to do. But you have to, when you're on the mat, you have to turn in the most greedy, selfish bastard known to man in order to win. And it, you know, you can't give an inch. You have to take and take and take. And, you know, it's very difficult to, uh, to get that across to people and not sound like a total asshole, you know? And I, 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 I just, uh, but that's just the truth. It's just, the way it is you can't do it any other way and if you want to be successful you know and I, I i don't know of any other way to do it now when you get out you become a coach like i did you have to go to the complete opposite end of the spectrum you have to give away everything you know you have to show everybody all the secrets that you know because you want them to be as successful as you were so it was very difficult for me to make that transition by the way when I went from competing to coaching, especially when I became the head coach at BYU, I had a very difficult time giving my secrets away because I sacrificed so much to learn those secrets. I mean, I, it was trial and error and over and over again and just 
trying to figure out which moves were the best moves. And then I finally figured it out after years of, you know, excruciating pain. And they want me to just give that away for just for nothing, you know, for, you know, and I just, it was very difficult for me to make that transition. And I, I don't want to say I was a bad coach. I had a winning record when I was at BYU and I never avoided any, I didn't avoid any of the toughest competition. I looked for the toughest competition I could, but it was not easy making that transition. And some guys make that transition better than others. As a matter of fact, a lot of guys that never compete make better coaches than former competitors. And it's just, it's, uh, unless you've been through it, it's it's hard to explain unless you actually, you know, suffered through all the things that you had to suffer through. I mean, Matt, you know this better than anybody. I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but this, this is for your audience. That's just the way it is. So uh, w one of the things I, I didn't mention last uh, time we talked yesterday briefly, uh, I spent some time at Oklahoma State. My wife uh, did her veterinary degree there. So I got to work out there a little bit and talk with those guys through the years. And I heard something similar. Like they mentioned that like even John Smith went through a period when he first started coaching where he had to realize, like you said, that first initial transition between having to focus on you, like you're your brand, whether it's UFC or in, whatever to now translating that to others i they said he had he had a challenge with that at first too and and as a scientist i've had to manage that where you know i have to as a professor train the students in my lab to do the work that i'm used to leading as like the the wrestler out of the map by yourself and i think that what you're saying i i think about in the context of recognizing that it's hard to come to terms sometimes with the reality that a lot of times your athletes don't want it as bad as you did. You, we just assume naturally that other people had the same motivation that we did or want to be there for the same reasons. And then I think that as a coach grows, you start to realize that everybody has their own motivations, their own reasons to be there. And that's where you sort of learn that coaching jujitsu of how to get in their head and how to turn those switches and knobs for them. Yeah, you, you really have to get to know each individual like intimately to know how to turn those switches and knobs for that particular individual. You know, it's a it's a very close interpersonal relationship, and you know it. it you can't just have like some blanket policy for everybody that works for it. It doesn't work that way. You you got to see you know identify what that individual's problem is and see if you can find a, a solution for it and that takes a lot of work on each individual and you just have to spend time with them you know a lot of times you know somebody will lose and you know when, when you win everybody wants to be around you everybody wants to be your friend but when you lose you know it's like you lose alone well I didn't let my wrestlers lose alone. I would spend time with those guys and I wouldn't necessarily say much. I would just spend time with them afterwards just to let them know I was there because they don't have to go through it alone. And then after they get over that loss, you know, I would try to try and point out, you know, the mistakes that they make because that's what wrestling is. It's a, I mean, that's how winning is done. You find your mistakes and you eliminate them because sometimes, you know, especially in these high level world competitions one mistake is all it takes to make difference between you know eternal glory and and you know being forgotten the next day you know so it's very um difficult to try to explain this but uh yeah you've got it it's it's not a it's not a, like a, a turnkey solution for everybody you have to you have to take the time to learn that kid's personality. To, I mean, as a coach, you know, as a wrestler, you don't have to care about anybody except yourself, which is kind of like, it's a little more simple. It's kind of like a soldier, you know, a soldier is, 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 his intention is to find the enemy and kill him. That's a very simple set of rules, you know, but to, to lead, you know, a bunch of different soldiers 
you have to know uh, who the leaders are and who to, you know, who's got problems with, you know, uh, you know, shooting or keeping their head too low or whatever. And it's, it's difficult sometimes to fix those people if they don't want to fix them because when it's very difficult to, to, to commiserate or to, to, to associate or, or understand somebody that doesn't have the same priorities as you have. If you're a, a, a guy who wants to be to everybody in the world and he doesn't, well, you know, he wants to be a lawyer or a doctor or something. Well, that's a very different set of priorities, you know, if he's just doing wrestling for the scholarship or if it's life and death, you know, I'm assuming for Matt, it was pretty life and death. You know, I'm assuming for most people, it's not. And it's, it's a very different kind of personality you're dealing with when you got to deal with a guy like Matt, as opposed to, you know, somebody, you know, that is, wants to be a doctor, you know, or something. We, we've talked about that a couple of times in, in the podcast over the years of like, sort of like practice partners in the room. Like Matt and I, when we first made friends years ago, we kind of realized that we were both the guys on our respective teams that nobody wanted to practice with. Like we were the last guy standing with our hands up, like who needs a partner? Because it was like, we, we, we wanted to do, we wanted to be a champion, not an all American. Like we want to be the very best. And that meant like it was go time in practice. And that means like, we weren't there to make friends or, you know what I mean? And that's that, like you said, that's, that's not, it was a, it's always a surprise to my system that people, that there's people who don't think that way. And then I realized that almost nobody thinks that way. That's right. It's a strange uh, realization that you come to when you, when, you know, I, I remember one guy talking to me at Stanford and he was trying to tell me about how he was sort of concerned about one of his competitors. And I was thinking to myself, that's a strange mentality to be, have any concern about your competitors because you're you. You should be trying to destroy that guy. Who cares about him? You're you. And he just, it was almost like a foreign idea that came into his head. It just had never, I don't think he ever thought of that before. And I have never thought of the complete, uh, the, uh, the opposite before. It was just some people, you know, everybody's different. I, I used to think everybody was the same when I was younger and, you know, but I've realized that people are the same as far as what they want in life. They want, everybody wants ha happiness and love and acceptance, but the way they go about it is very different. And I, it took me a long time to come to that realization. Well, you were on a lot of teams and you, you say you were selfish, but <laughs> in the right way, you know, to, to win. But when you were on teams, you, you had to be the type of guy that made your teams better. Uh, I mean, right. And what, what were some of the things you did in the room uh, outside of practice or, or at competitions to make your teammates better? What were some of the things that, that you did? Well, I, I have to be honest with you. I was not, I did not care that much about the team score. I only cared about, you know, to me, wrestling was not a team sport. It was an individual sport, but there were certain things. Let me give you an example. Yeah, uh, there was a guy, a heavyweight on our team, Steve Dr. Death Williams. Do you remember him? Yeah. He's great. Yeah, of course you do. Yeah. And he used to, uh, he was a heavyweight. He weighed 280 pounds. He didn't have to cut one pound to, to make weight. Well, every day before some competition, we'd be getting our plastics and our sweats on, and we'd be running around the room and getting on our stationary bikes, trying to cut our weight down. And he would put on sweats and plastics himself and run around the room and I looked at this guy in awe and I loved him for it because he wanted to show us. And this guy was not a full year wrestler. He was spent most, he was on a football scholarship. He didn't have to wrestle, but he wanted to show us that he was willing to suffer with us. And to me, it just made me love the guy that much more. And I just, because I had been around other heavyweights that were just 
you know, they, while we were cutting weight, they would actually eat and drink in front of us. And here's Steve, you know, suffering along with us. And, uh, you know, I mean, other than that, I think all you can do is lead by example because it's so, wrestling is so consuming. It's so all consuming that you just, you can't really, I mean, if, if, if I had somebody ask me a question, like my brother Andre Metzger asked me how I did a certain move, of course I'd show them. But, uh, you know, I tried to keep my secrets to myself, you know, and only share them with only a few people, you know, that I trusted and they wouldn't, you know, go blab it to everybody. But uh, I think that you can, I think it's just like the military, you have to lead by example. And that's, I'm not, I, I wasn't really e even interested in being a leader necessarily or making my team better necessarily, but you could, you could always tell the guys that, that were the leaders because they hung out together and they, you know, they had, you know, to me, my brother, Andre Metzger, Jim Humphrey, we were like this group and we hung out together all the time. And what well, the reason when, when I got into, I kind of got into that group because I was Dave's brother, but I want to get in that group because I wanted to put pressure on myself so that when we went to a tournament and they won and I lost, I was going to be miserable. And there's a part in that movie the fox catcher where I'm smashing my head against the wall. I'm tearing my clothes up. I'm screaming. I'm crying. I'm punching this lamp. I wanted to make losing the most miserable experience it could possibly be. So I never made that stupid idiot mistake of putting that ugly stain on my name and reputation again. Losing was the crime. It was the sin that I could not commit. And had I not hung around guys that felt the same way, I mean, and I learned this from Dave. When Dave lost, he'd act the same way. He wanted to make losing so miserable that he never made that mistake again. And so I tried to emulate Dave. It's very easy to get good if you find winners and you watch them and copy them. You know, it, it, it's you just watch and copy. It's all it is. And, that's what I did with those guys. And thank God, you know, it worked. I mean, I can only thank God it worked. I, I don't know. I just, I, I, I don't, I never knew that I was going to get any good in wrestling. I just thank God that it finally came. I remember the day, I remember the moment it came too. I was wrestling Mike Deanna in the finals of the Great Plains and I was beating it. This is the year after I saw him take second in the NCAAs to Mark Torella and I was beating him like three to one. And then this, it was like this incredible, surprising, exhilarating experience happened to me. It was like the clouds opened up and the gods of wrestling shined down upon me and showed me the secrets of wrestling. And I felt this and I, gave him my leg and I like almost dared him to try to take me down because I knew he couldn't take me down. And I beat him like eight to one. That was, I won my very first college match. That was my introduction from, you know, nobody into the elite class of wrestlers. I think something you said about leadership really kind of resonated, which is that the, the impact of leading by example, you know, like there's, there's a saying that says, you know, preach the gospel and if necessary, use words, you know, where, you know, it's what you do. It's the actions that people want to follow because there's guys who could be real vocal. You say all the right stuff, but if you're not doing the right stuff, nobody really wants to follow that, those footsteps, you know, and like you said, that you want to follow winners. You want to mimic the winners. And so it's like those actions matter. And when you mentioned the military thing, it got me thinking that, so one of the books that I read maybe a year or two ago, uh, written by some guys you might know, oh, yeah. the Bannock Brothers. Uh, I know you guys, you guys had some matches and they wrote a book basically called Service Leadership that was actually pretty good. And it was their kind of framework of leading from the vantage point of being a servant, kind of what you talked about on the transition to coaching, where it's like now you're there in order to actually 
essentially wash the feet and serve the people around, serve all those guys in fundamentally different ways. And that's the way to propel those guys forward through that capacity of leadership. And I think wrestling is so special because you have that individual component, but yet, even if it's just you and your brother, Dave, in the wrestling room, you guys are there helping each other to get better. Even if it means being selfish to be a barbarian against each other in the, in the training room to try to kill each other, you know that you're trying to kill him is out of love because you're trying, you know that that's what the Russian's going to try to do to him. He's going to try to kill him. So I better try to kill him because that's how we're going to get stronger. And that's how we're going to find those weak links in, 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 in I, I, I don't it. think people understand just how valuable our opponents and our enemies really are to us because they give us the opportunity to practice our most brutal moves without any feelings of remorse or mercy. And it, we, I remember there was this, in Oklahoma's wrestling room, we had these three posts that you know, held up the roof and there was padding around these posts. And there was one post and around the base, there was padding on each post. And around one post, there was no padding. It was just bare wood. And so my greatest opponent to make the team at Oklahoma was Israel Shepard. And this dude was a badass. He was built like Hercules. He had the most, he was, him and I would finish first and second in every sprint race we had. And I thought in my 20 year old brain, if you can ever get your opponent, and, you know, who's trying to beat you off the team up in the air and aim their head towards that bare wood, that's what they should be doing. So every time I got Israel up in the air, I try to aim his head and try to just kill him. And but I had no feelings of remorse, no feelings of mercy. And looking back on it, at the time, I was like so emotional and so, you know, trying to just create all this emotion. And, but at the time I was, but now as I look back, I have a very deep appreciation for Israel and a very deep love for him because he allowed me to use those brutal, uh, you know, uh, moves you know, without any feelings of wrong. and you get better when you when you when you uh, when you don't have to deal with those kinds of feelings of mercy and remorse. I remember when I got fired one one time from Stanford. When I came back from the World Championships uh, after the nineteen eighty five World Championships, I'm the only eighty four Olympic champion to win the eighty five Worlds. And I come back to Stanford where I'm coaching, and everybody's so happy, and they're slapping me on the back. Great job, Mark! You did so great. After that practice, the Stanford coach goes, hey, I got to talk to you. And he brings me in his office. And I'm thinking he's going to tell me how sorry he is for making me feel lesser than my brother Dave. And he's going to give me a raise. And I'm thinking all these great things are going to happen, right? Well, he fires me. He fires me. And I'm like, how can you fire me? I'm the most successful wrestler in the United States. I just proved to everybody that I could beat all the Russians to boycott the Olympics. And so now what am I going to do? Well, uh, he, I, I, I just got a wrestling directory out and I started calling up coaches in different areas and setting up clinics. And I could tell within two seconds whether I had a clinic or not because the success of any team is based on the end enthusiasm of the coach if the coach is enthusiastic they're going to have a good team and he's going to be following wrestling and wrestlers he's going to know everybody who's competing in the world championships so i'd call somebody up and i'd be like hey this is mark schultz if he was like oh man mark schultz oh my god i'm like oh, okay i know i got a clinic plus i know that's a good team because he's so enthusiastic if i called my i was like hey this is mark schultz he'd be like yeah i'd be like Okay, forget it. I hang up and call somebody else. And that to me is the key to being a successful coach is how enthusiastic you are for the sport of wrestling. Student, being a student of, of not just the not just what's going on currently, but maybe even some of the historical perspectives and what the, the people that have gone before us, you know, have gone through and what they accomplished and all that stuff. It does matter, doesn't it? 
It does. You have to respect those people that have come before you and accomplished those things before you, or you're disrespecting the very thing you want to become. It doesn't work. So, you know, it makes me think of something, but I, I don't want, I for, don't want to forget this other thing. So, so Matt, one of the things Mark and I talked a little bit about yesterday that your story about Stanford made me realize again here, Mark, was this idea that, right. It's, it's obvious and it's timeless, but like life ain't fair. And I think that's something that wrestling, right, hits home, especially in, 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 in a lot of ways, but like on the international scene for America and in, in middle school matches. But it's like, it's, we think it's as the fairest sport in the world. It doesn't matter your race, color, size, age, right? It's the fairest sport in the world. But then like, you know, if you leave it in a ref's hands, you failed. If the ref's got to make a decision, you didn't pin them. You didn't separate the score enough. And because it is absolutely not fair on the international side, we know we've had, you know, famous situations where Americans, they get, they lose all the time to the international refs. I mean, you guys see that in freestyle and Greco all the time, but like, it's just not fair. But like, that's something that I learned as a division three JV walk-on kind of guy, a nobody that like, you learn from wrestling and it's not fair, but when you get into life and you graduate and you're just out there working that, you know, I know as a, as a guy in the streets, I've got to do whatever I've got to do in life to make sure that I don't leave it in the ref's hands because there ain't a damn thing fair about it. But like, you can be the best guy when your world championship come home and they're like, uh, yeah, like that's crazy. It's crazy. It's insane. And, and so my question, actually, I, I, I didn't want to forget that because we talked about it yesterday, but I think it's such a valuable part about wrestling that we learn from the champion level to the, the, the junior high JV level. But like what you were talking about, knowing your history, I want to ask both of you guys, you guys are legends. And, you know, I was having my, my wife and I, we watched Foxcatcher the other night, getting ready to, to talk with you. And she was watching that scene where you were beating yourself up in the hotel and then you started ordering all the food and eating all the food. And she's like, what's he doing? Like, what's the big deal? And I was explaining like, well, he's hurt trying to hurt himself. So he doesn't have to weigh in. Like she, and I was trying to explain. And then she watched the weight cut scene after that. And, you know, couldn't comprehend. So my question for you guys is like, can you tell the younger guy, people watching the new generation, what was it like? What was it like back then in those eras before we have, you know, Things have changed a lot for better, for, for, but like, what was reality? Like, what was your life like as a competitor, as an athlete? And like, how crazy was that? It was incredibly hard. I mean, basically you had to voluntarily impoverish yourself to be able to spend all your time training to compete against professional Soviets. I mean, what else can you do? Go on welfare? I guess you could join the military. I was about to join the military. Matter of fact, I should have joined the military when I was a fox catcher because, but I grew up in the Vietnam era and we had a guy, my dad rents this house out to all these people. And we had a guy in there that went to Vietnam. And when he came back, he was so screwed up in the head. I was like, no way am I going to touch the military after this. And of course, Vietnam is the only war America's lost. And we didn't really lose it. The politicians lost it. But they treated our guys so unfairly and just went, they came back so screwed up. And I just, uh, that, 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 uh, there's no, I, when I, when I tell people about the movie Foxcatcher, I tell them, look, it's about 95% fiction. The only real thing in that movie is, the, that the murder happened exactly how it happened in the court records and i actually did cut 12 pounds in 90 minutes and that scene that where i'm eating all that food i basically decided to quit the sport of wrestling i didn't care about it anymore it was impossibly hard see the the, the problem with that movie is it didn't really show just how hard it was for me to deal with this psychopath on a daily basis when he and when I didn't have time to, 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 to prepare to, to train for the Olympics and he didn't, it's a very, very long story and I don't want to take up too much time on it, but the, it's about nine, the movie's about 90% fiction 
the, the book that it came from is 100% true. But I did not actually throw up. In the movie, it shows me throwing up and then going and weighing in and showing that I'm 12 over and that I've only got 90 minutes to make weight. That's not true. I went over to make weight. I saw I was 12 over. And then I threw up. And then I was 10 and a half over and then I lost 10 and a half in 90 minutes. But uh, <laughs> Mike Sheets, the guy I'm going to have to wrestle the next day, he's standing right behind me and he sees that I'm 12 over. And so he's thinking, there's no way he's going to make weight. It's only 90 minutes. And he goes off and he's eating dinner and he's having a good time. He's like, I'm going to make the Olympic team by default tomorrow because there's no way he's going to make weight. And then some guy came up to him and he goes, hey, Mark Schultz made weight. And I heard he spit his food out. He's like, <clears throat> like <laughs> Well, Matt, you had a pretty crazy weight cut too for the Olympic uh, rematch, right? Yeah, it was, it was uh, nine, nine and a half kilos in 24 hours. I had, I had more than 90 minutes, but uh, it was, uh, it was how, quite a... How many kilos? Nine and a half. Nine and a half kilos, not pounds. Not pounds. But this was 24 hours. This was That's 24 cool. hours. Amazing. This was after the court case, and I and I got the the go ahead for the uh, the re wrestle the match. And as you know, I I beat the opponent nine uh, zero back when it was a ten point tech ball. Um, but the court case continued. The, the the cases continued on after that, and there was there was more arbitrations and more appeals and all that. But uh, you know, I finally got what I what I wanted, which was an opportunity to to have a fair match uh, re wrestled, and and they said, okay, it's tomorrow. Wow. So, yeah, that was. Uh, but you know, besides, you know, the the difficulties of like like Mark said was, you know, not having not having enough money to just even feed your family. The difference between, you know, me losing the, uh, in the '96 Olympic trials was the difference between me not being able to afford to live in Colorado Springs and, and train at the Olympic Training Center anymore. When I took second, or I took third that year, I, I uh, on the team, I was getting the $500 stipend instead of the $1,000 number one stipend. That was the difference. And so ultimately I, I had an opportunity and I was very blessed to, to get that opportunity to go coach at, at the University of Nebraska while I was finishing up, you know, trying to make an Olympic team but it was another quad away, but I had four years to, to prepare. And, you know, just, just the fact that I was able to have that salary um, allowed me to come back and travel out to Colorado Springs almost on a monthly basis, uh, even though I was living in Nebraska at the same time. And that's, that's where I, I, I started changing my thought process and started working with, with a lot of athletes. Uh, one of the athletes that I was working with before I took that position was Chael Sonnen, who, ended up moving out to, to BYU to be a part of Mark Schultz program. When I, when I was coaching him, he was still in high school. And I just remember his, his dream was to wrestle for Mark Schultz. And, you know, I kind of want to hear a little bit because he, he, that was all he wanted to do. He wanted to go out and wrestle for Mark Schultz. And here's a Catholic boy going to a, a Mormon college. How did that end up? How did, tell us that little story about how, you recruited him, how he got to you, and then ultimately he left and went back to Oregon. Yeah, I first I have to tell you, I really love Chael Sonnen a lot. He, I think he's a great guy. He's one of my favorite uh, guys that's ever wrestled for me. I was his first Brazilian jiu-jitsu instructor, and uh, I really wanted him bad. And everybody was telling me what a great kid he was. You know, he was smart. He was... Um, he, he, he was clean, he clean cut, you know, he was kind of like the all-American boy. And so I got him to agree to come to BYU. It was pretty easy because he wanted to go wherever I was. And the problem with BYU is the honor code office. They have this honor code, which is very different than other schools. I don't think any other school has it. And you have to agree to to withhold from participating in all kinds of things. And one of the things you have to agree to is not having sex before marriage. 
Well, 99% of the kids are not going to sign that agreement. So you're kind of stuck with um, an all LDS team. Oh, by the way, we don't call ourselves Mormons. Uh, that's kind of a name that was given to us by other people. It's, we're members of the Church of Jesus Christ. But I just want to get that straight. Anyway, he comes out and he's great. You know, he's tough. He's, and he's learning jujitsu and he's kicking the crap out of everybody. And I'm thinking this guy is going to be great. And then I start getting reports back from the honor code office that he's not complying with certain aspects of the honor code. And they start threatening me and my job and then my ability to feed my family because I'm going to get fired if I keep, uh, you know, having kids on my team that are not complying with the honor code. And so I took them aside and I said, you know, I got to, as much as I love you, Jail, I, I don't think this is the right place for you. And so he transferred back to the University of Oregon. And uh, I, I really, uh, I, I love the fact that he came and wrestled for me, but I really, uh, I missed him when he left. And I, uh, I was really disappointed that, that we couldn't stay together for his entire college career. And it just wasn't the right place. And, you know, I used to think before I came to BYU, I used to think, all right, I'm going to have completely new plans. I'm going to bring in all these non LDS kids. I'm going to get all these Mexican kids or I'm going to uh, get them scholarships through the multicultural office. And I'm going to pack the team with kids that are on multicultural scholarships. And I don't care about what religion they are. I just want to get the best wrestlers in there. Well, after I was there for about a year, I realized other people, other kids can other non LDS kids just could not withstand that kind of environment. It's too restrictive for them. But for these LDS kids, they've been brought up in that environment their whole life. So it's no big deal to them. And it, it, it I think it was a culture shock that hit Cheo when he, when he got there and it caused a problem for, for him and for me. And I, I regret losing him, but you know, I, I love the guy and I'm, I'm glad he came there and I get to claim that I was his first jujitsu and wrestling coach in college. So, you know, and then BYU, and plus it, it really wasn't the best place for him to go as it turned out anyway, because they dropped the program a couple of years later. And so it, you know, it was like, I, I could have got Ruan Gardner to go there and, but you know, I was being told by my athletic director that we're on the chopping block for title nine. Well, how do you, t how do you convince a kid to come to your school when you know that this program may not be around in the next year or two? It's, it's almost, it's like you got to lie to the kid to get him to go there. I, I can't do that. So I just, I, 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 but I ended up with an all LDS team, just like the previous coach. And we ended up winning the, we won the WAC conference, but we weren't in the WAC conference when we went. That was a big deal to win the Western Athletic Co Division Conference. And we were always third or fourth and stuff, but we finally beat everybody in the WAC conference, but we weren't in the WAC conference when we did it. We moved into the Western Regionals in preparation for dropping the program. And the program was dropped by an All-American wrestler athletic director. He comes up to the wrestling room and he tells us we're going to be dropped. And I was like, you know what's going to happen if you drop us? You're an All-American wrestler. You wrestle. You were fifth in the NCAAs for BYU, and you're dropping your own sport. You know what's going to happen to your name? It's going to be mud in the next year. Everybody in high school is going to revolt and turn on you, and your name's going to be ruined. But you know, he I, he was being forced to do it by the president, BYU president, you know, to comply with this, I call it the misinterpretation of Title IX. So, that's well, uh, before we Before we finish up, I want to hear your, your journey from wrestling to getting a black belt in, in jiu-jitsu and ultimately you, you fought in the UFC against Gary Goodrich. Uh, 
But how, how did you, how did you decide, all right, I want to start studying jujitsu because I, I, st I still study jujitsu. I didn't start doing it till after I, I competed in MMA. I, I never, I, I mean, catch wrestling, submission wrestling, but I never put on a, a gi. Um, yeah. But, but now I, I train daily with, with a gi on still. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm still not as good with a gi on as I am without a gi, obviously, probably the same reason that you are. Uh, you know, we're wrestlers, we don't wear gis. So. Uh, but um, what happened, the way I got into it was I was just minding my own business, you know, at my house in Provo, just, I don't know, waiting for practice to roll around or something. And I get this phone call from some guy, his name was Steve Bishop. And he says, is this Mark Schultz, Olympic wrestling champ? I go, yeah. He goes, the greatest jiu-jitsu fighter in the world is in town. Do you want to fight him? And I said, well, what are the rules? And he was trying to intimidate me. He's a real prick. He goes, there are no rules. I was like, what are you talking about? There are no rules. What are we? And I'm thinking to myself, what's he talking about? This is, what are we going to do? Commit a homicide on the BYU campus? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm a faculty member. <laughs> I'm like, okay. I said, you tell him. I just said, okay. I'm not going to let somebody punk me. And I go, yeah, you tell him to meet me in the BYU wrestling room a week from Thursday. And I'm thinking, what are we going to do? We're going to commit a homicide? So, that's what I thought we were going to do. So I'm scared to death all week. I don't know what's going on. I've never even heard of jujitsu. So I show up in the wrestling room that day and Hicks and Gracie is trying to hook the heels of our head coach at the time, Alan Albright. And he's scooting on his butt, trying to get closer and closer. And he's got his head shaved about halfway back, completely shaved. And then he's got this huge, long braided, uh, hair all the way down his back. And he looked exactly like the guy from Kumite, the uh, movie Kumite. I think he was, I don't know if you, I don't know if he's trying to Im imitate him or what, but he looked very intimidating and he had cauliflower ears. And I was like, holy shit, the guy's got cauliflower ears. Pardon my French. And he goes, uh, what were, I, I, he looks at me. Er, er, well, as soon as I walk in the room, everybody stops what they're doing. And he gets up from his butt and he walks over to me and he goes, are you the guy? I go, yeah, I'm the guy. Are you the guy? He goes, yeah, I'm the guy. And he goes, okay, what I do normally when I'm fighting is I uh, use, I punch and I kick and I elbow and knee and I head butt and all that. He goes, but we're not going to do that today. We're just going to do submission grappling until one of us taps out. I never even heard of tapping out before. But I was thanking God we weren't going to commit a homicide. So I was like, well, at least no one's going to die today. So I, we started, uh, and I, he stood straight up in the middle of the room. And I, you know, I'm used to crouching down like a wrestler. And so I was like, wow, this guy's going to be an easy takedown. So I took him down. He puts me in the guard. And we stay there for about 20 minutes. And I'm trying, I'm, I've never done submission holds because they're against the rules in wrestling. And so I'm making stuff up on my own. And the only thing I knew from a little bit of judo that I did was to keep my chin down and to keep my elbows in. So I'm doing that and I'm surviving, but I'm on top of him for like 20 minutes. And finally he throws a triangle around me. And I'm, I kind of let him do it because I didn't understand what he was doing, but I could tell he was going for something you know, an explosive, he, he was going for something quickly. And so he throws his legs around my arm and my head. And the next thing I know, I'm tapping out. And I was like, wow, that is a great move. Let's go again. And so we went again for about another 20 minutes. And he, and I'm on top of him for like 20 more minutes. And I'm not getting any submission holds on him. And I'm making stuff up on the fly and nothing's working. Of course, this guy knows how to stay out of submission holes. And so I thought I've been on top of him for 20 minutes. Nothing's happened. Maybe I'll let him try and get on top of me. So I let him reverse me and me being a wrestler, I brainwashed myself to go belly down. Well, that's the worst thing you can do in jujitsu. 
And so I go belly down. I'm like trying to keep him from turning me. You know, I've got my arms out. And he just slips in a rear naked and I'm tapping out again. And so afterwards he goes, man, you're the toughest guy I've ever gone against. This is what he told me. He goes, if you learn what I know, I'm going to quit. And so I thought that was a great compliment. And I loved him for saying that. And I became a student of his student. His student was Pedro Sauer. And I called up Pedro and I said, can I be your student? He's like, yeah, my friend, come on down. And I became a student for like three years. And then the UFC came to America and uh, Pedro had this fight in Salt Lake City. It was the first no holes barred fight in the state of Utah. And it was against Lance Batchelor, a uh, 250 pound bodybuilder. And he beat Lance and his gi was all covered in blood. It was just a huge amount of testosterone in the room at the time. And then uh, Pedro calls me and goes, Dave Benito, the, he's either first or second ranked in Canada, heavyweight wrestling. And he goes, he's going to fight in the UFC, in UFC 9. Can you train with him? I said, sure. So he comes down to BYU and he trained with me for two weeks. And one day I lifted him up and I slammed him and I broke his hand and I took him to the hospital and the doctor said, well, if we put a cast on, you can't fight, obviously they're going to know you got a broken hand, but if we put a plate in, you might be able to, you know, keep it secret and then fight with a broken hand. And so, I went to Detroit with him, and during the press conference, somebody tattled on Dave and said, he's got a broken hand. And the fight doctor went over to Dave, took a look at his hand, and said, I'm not going to let you fight. So I went over to the promoter, and I go, hey, what do you think about the idea of me taking Dave's place? And he... Uh, he goes, oh, that's a great idea. You're an Olympic gold medalist. When you lose, it'll be even better. <laughs> I was like, all right. So we start negotiating a purse right then and there. And we couldn't come to an agreement. Uh, I wanted $50,000 to win or lose. And they wanted $50,000 to win, twenty five dollars to lose. And we couldn't come to an agreement. And finally, they keep calling me all during the night, waking me up at all hours of the night. We need a decision. We need to say, finally, at 10 in the morning, they go, if you don't decide right now, we're going to get somebody else. Because they had to have somebody. So I went down to the lobby and I went over to a corner and I started to pray. I go, give me a minute. And I started praying, asking God what I should do. And I got this very strong feeling that I should do it. So I got up off my knees, I went over, I said, I'll do it. I signed the contract. Eight hours later, I was fighting in the octagon. That's how it happened. And one fight and that was it, the one and done. Yeah, well, what happened after that was a lot, this is in the Knowles, there, this is before the invention of MMA. This yeah, is the no, this is the NHB. Product. Right, NHB. So there was a lot of negative publicity about this fight. And I was put on the cover of the Salt Lake Tribune on top of Gary Goodrich. This is a color photo. It's his blood on the ground. This is a LDS community I'm living in. And a lot of the women got upset that a BYU faculty member, I remember this quote, this woman goes, I don't think it's appropriate for a BYU faculty member to turn one of God's children into hamburger. And so I got called on the carpet on that BYU president calls me into his office and I go into the office and I said, uh, and he said to me, Mark, you can keep working at BYU, but you can't do that. That's not what we're about here. And I had three kids at the time and they needed health insurance. And so I decided to just keep my job and, and because uh, there was no real big money in UFC at the time. I mean, if you won a three-man tournament, it was like $50,000. That's not very much for winning a three-man Knowles Bard tournament. And if you lose, you get nothing and you got a bunch of hospital bills. So I thought I better just keep my job. You know, nowadays, if it was the money they had nowadays, I would have, 
I would have probably keep potting to keep. And plus, I was about 36 years old. My back had herniated. I was not in the greatest shape physically. So I decided to just stop fighting at that point and retire 1-0. Oh. Wow. Mark, thank, thank you for sharing that story with us. And thanks for joining us today and giving us some good leadership lessons. And it was just a pleasure to, to reconnect with you and chat. And uh, hope, hope you guys are, uh, the fires are out down in Southern Oregon. And uh, how, how's that going? Is that better? <laughs> My city, Phoenix, Oregon, is the most damaged city from the fires of any other city in the state. There's a thousand homes were burned down. If you drive down uh, Highway 99, you can see just all of these places, businesses burned to the ground. And, but thank God my home wasn't affected. I, I was covered in smoke though for about a week and I bought a little filter, air filter thing to try to breathe better. but. Thank God my home was, wasn't, wasn't affected. Mark, do you have any messages um, for the young guys that, who are training? Um, because, you know, one of the things I think is, you know, about amateur wrestling, and I think you're such a, in a unique position given the prominence of the, your fox catcher story. And, um, you know, as you know, amateur wrestling, there's not a lot of money for these guys anyways, but Greco doesn't have a lot of funding in particular, you know, these guys, you know, they're, they're doing the same struggle that you guys did and you guys were amateurs too. Like, what would you say to these guys who, who might be struggling financially and want to keep committing for a couple more years or, you know, feel that normal tug to say, maybe I should go and do something else to make some money or, or how do I, climb to the top of that pyramid without all those resources of funding um what's the role that 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 the money can play in a good way in a bad way based on your really special experience and what would you tell them to encourage him to persevere yeah um you know wrestling is everybody knows it's the hardest sport there is and you can you know, you can live off your parents when you're in high school. If you go to college, you can live in the dorms and they'll feed you. And if you get a scholarship, you can keep competing then. And then after college, your options are pretty limited. You, if you don't get a job working as an assistant coach for somebody somewhere, you know, it's, it's almost impossible to continue to sacrifice all of your time and energy to uh, compete against these professional Soviets. So if I had to live my life over again, uh, I would not have chosen to go to Foxcatcher. Like, of course, hindsight's 2020. I would have, and, and the military is completely different than it is back when I was growing up. I would join the military and I would wrestle for them. Uh, I would probably join the Air Force. Matter of fact, I coached at the Air Force for a year with Wayne Bachman. I would join the Air Force and become a pilot. I've always wanted to be a pilot, but my eyes were so bad, I couldn't do it. And so I even lost a world title one time because I couldn't see the scoreboard and I was looking at my corner. And instead of Jay Robinson telling me to score or to shoot or stall, he started going, go, 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 go. And I thought I'm behind. And so I took a bad shot and the guy spun behind me. And I go back to the hotel. And I'm sitting at the bar drowning my sorrows. And Bruce Baumgartner comes up and goes, why did you shoot at the end? I go, because I was losing. He goes, no, you weren't. And I was like, oh, God. I could have been in the final. I could have had another world title. So there's no guarantee I would have won in the finals. But still, it was just devastating to learn that. So I would probably join the military. Um, uh, I don't know what other options there are besides being an assistant coach somewhere. Um, I, I don't know, Rest, it, wrestling is tough. There's not a lot of options out there for us like there is in, you know, I just brought Mansoor Barzagar over from Iran. He's the first world champion ever. He's also the national coach for Iran for like 20 some odd years. And when he won the world title, they gave him a copper mine 
just gave it to him. Here, have this. Come on. And he took the money he made from there and he bought office buildings, apartment complexes. He became one of the richest guys in, in, in Iran. And then I, he wanted to come to America to be closer to his daughter. And they asked me to write a letter to help him come here. And I said, it would be an honor. And so I wrote a letter and we got him to come here. And now I have dinner with him about once a month. But when Trump came out with his anti-Muslim ban until we figure out what's going on, I was asked if I agreed with that. And I said, yeah, I agree with it. At the same time, I'm bringing a Muslim over from Iran. And so the Daily Mail makes this huge article about how I'm anti-Muslim and all this. And I'm bringing a Muslim over from Iran while they're writing this terrible article about me. So that doesn't really have anything to do with your question. But. No, but but you, you answered it pretty well. And we, especially in Greco, that's one of our, our huge advantages is we have a really strong military presence with the Marine Corps and the Army WCAP programs. Very strong. Um, you know, a lot of our, our, na our national team and our world team members are comprised of the military branches. So we're very fortunate in Greco and uh, freestyle, you know, they're, they're really starting to add these regional training centers to the college programs. Uh, they're separate, but they're, they train alongside the college athletes. So that, that is helping in freestyle. And we're starting to, to add some of those to our Greco program as well. So, but you, you got to love it and you got to be willing to sacrifice and dedicate everything to it, to, to be the best in the world. Well, you know that better than anybody. And, and that's true. You just, the amount of sacrifice that goes into becoming a world-class wrestler is unparalleled in any other any other endeavor there is i remember but it, it, it pays you back it, it pays off you end up becoming a much better person much more confident you know how to fight it just it, it 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 permeates every other part of your life every other part of your body mind and soul it's worth it it's been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you, Mark. Matt, you take care, buddy. All right, brother. Okay.